don't let my beard fool you, I can change a tire. Uh, it's a hipster beard. I had wanted a supercar and I wanted something that I could just drive and have a great time and not worry about maintenance or depreciation or that sort of thing. And I'm looking around and I've settled on an Audi R8 and I have a friend who's an Audi tech. And that's kind of all he did was R8s. So Minnesota R8s is a very niche. There's not a lot of people who will work on R8s. The closest one I found was probably 60 miles from St. Paul. So he's like the guy, he's a friend of mine. His name's Jake. Jake, if you're watching, thanks a lot. He really helped me figure this out about what to look for, what options were available, what I'm being screwed on, certain things. And we looked at, you know, maybe a dozen different cars and I had settled on an R8 because that had the, the uh, depreciation had already happened by then. And it was something that I feel like I could see myself in. And I, because I'd gone from a bunch of like hand-built cars and race cars and a bunch of other things, I wanted to just drive something without ever having to worry it not starting. So I settled on the R8 and my wife didn't know that at the time. We happened to be watching Fifty Shades of Grey, as you do, because I think everybody was, had some weird perverse curiosity to see what it was all about. And uh, the, the main character, Grey or whatever his name, drives up in an R8 Spider, And my wife goes, ooh, I like that car. And to me, as the car guy, that is instant permission to go out and buy one. I'd call my buddy Jake every time I'd find one and say, hey, what do you think about this one? And he'd say, oh, the carbon blades are fake. That's not real. Uh, that's, you know, the, that's like a $2,000 option. You, you know, you should be doing this. You should, you know, make sure about this maintenance. That's too much mileage, et cetera, et cetera. He would tear apart basically every, every one that I, that I looked at. I know that Audi and Lamborghini are kind of the, you know, Volkswagen group of, of cars. And I said, so what's the difference between this and a Giardo? Why, not, why, not, why, why shouldn't I just buy a Giardo instead? So they're the same thing, right? And he said, well, Audi R8 is a Giardo with all the good Audi stuff on top of it. Think of it that way. So all the good Audi electronics, all the good Audi leather stuff and that sort of thing. And it's not as flashy, you know, if you want to remain kind of inconspicuous. So I found one, it was in Connecticut and thought I got a relatively good deal on it. Um, one of the ways that I also look for cars is a way that you also look for cars, which is to scour poorly worded, poorly advertised Craigslist and other uh, uh, sundry places sometimes for, for vehicles that are poorly photographed, poorly worded, but I, I can kind of see some stuff that I want, I want to ask about to, to further in, uh, do inquiries. And I look at big cities, that's where I go. So this one happened to be in Hartford, Connecticut. You know, Miami's a big one, Las Vegas, Texas, uh, California, those places tend to cluster with supercars. So that's where I would search. And I found one and we, we settled on the date and I flew out there to go get the car and he picks me up from the airport and he's this little Italian guy, he's about yay tall. And he's in this huge monster truck and there's his buddy in the back seat. And I instantly, because he's, he's very Italian, he's very proud of being Italian. He's got a buddy in the back seat who's pretty big dude. And I instantly, like the Godfather s music started playing in my head, like, are, are, am I gonna, you know, is this, am I being whacked? Is it, you know, right? Is this a setup? My wife didn't go with me that time. She wanted to go with, but unfortunately she couldn't go. And what I was gonna do is I was gonna wire him uh, the money. Well, there aren't any of my banks in Connecticut. None, zero. And I didn't realize this until I got there and I'm standing in front of him and the car is right there and we're stuck. So I end up having to do some banking switcheroo. She, my wife ends up going to the bank for me. We're on the phone with her. She has to wire him the money from our bank. I have to wire her the money from, me, from my phone to her bank account. I'm with the guy, he's in the driver's seat, I'm in the passenger seat and I'm talking to him through the car phone and uh, the banker keeps calling me Scott. I don't know why. And this guy is looking at me and he, he goes, and I said, and, I, and I, I muted, I said, no, I don't know why he's calling me Scott. And so now he's starting to get paranoid. 
that something's up, like I'm starting to scam him or something. And then uh, she has to then wire him the money and then we, we, we sit there for like two hours. And I'm sitting there with his wife who is like f stuffing coffee and cake in my face the whole time. And his dad is there and his friend goes, all right, I'm gonna leave. And I look at the dad, I look at the wife and I look at him. And I, I looked at him and I said, did you invite all these people over here to see if I was a nut job? And he goes, yeah, I figured you were crazy. Oh, okay, cool. So I sit back, the transfer goes through, he gets his money and, and I drive home. And I play a little game with my friends on Facebook. I, you know, I tend to go through a fair amount of cars. So I would take really, really difficult photos to discern, like really close up photos of the car on my trip back, because it was like a 22 hour drive home. And it rained for 400 straight miles all the way through. And so I would periodically take a photo of like, you know, the carbon fiber and that was it. Just, you know, real close up carbon fiber and people would guess and they would have a lot of fun. And, and then every hour I would stop or something, I would, I would do this. And just for funsies, I went and took a picture of like the headlight of a Camry and posted that. And that really threw people off. So that was a lot of fun. I was driving through Chicago and you instantly knew I was in Chicago when I'm in the right lane doing 80 miles an hour, not even, you know, just kind of minding my own business. And I get past easily 20 miles an hour faster by a 458, just whizzes right by me. Okay, I'm in Chicago. Not maybe two minutes later, there's a Dodge Charger and probably eight other kind of middle of the road, you know, fun muscle cars all whiz by me, whiz, weaving in and out of traffic, probably doing 100, 120. In that pack was a cop and was weaving in and out with them. No lights, no nothing. I just figured they were along for the ride or having a good time, but that's when you knew you were in Chicago. So I get it back and uh, I have a great time with it. It's a wonderful car and I suddenly dawned on me, I have this nature where I have to tinker with things. I can't leave them alone. I just can't. And I start looking at the aftermarket for the R8 market and there is absolutely nothing. You can get aftermarket exhaust, but the car already had it. You can get some wheels, the car already had it. You either go full nutso twin turbo deal or you just leave it stock. There's no headers, there's no nothing for these R8s. And I'm kind of irritated at this because I, I wanted to tinker with something. I want to make it faster. I want to make it go do something and I can't. And now I've got nothing. And now I'm bored. I've owned a Viper, I've owned a Porsche, uh, Camaro, uh, Corvette. Uh, I hand built a race car one time. And the a type of attention you get with an R8 is totally different. Every other car I've owned, the attention you get is, hey, what kind of car is that? What have you done to it? How fast is it? Awesome, super cool. When you show up in an R8 that is all bl triple black, inside, outside, carbon, you know, the carbon blades, the whole bit, everybody doesn't care about the car. Everybody wants to go, what do you do for a living? And the thing is, as I tried to impress upon people is I don't make a ton of money, but over the years I've saved, I've built things, I've sold them, I have done side work and everything and I've saved my pennies. And that's how I was able to afford an R8 over time. It wasn't something that you just, you know, you turn 21 and you get that $150,000 a year job. It just doesn't work that way. So, you know, at 35, I was able to buy an, an R8 because I had scrimp save and uh, this was a passion of mine. And yeah, that's how you afford an R8. And I got very, very bored with it very quickly and I ended up selling it for exactly the same price I bought it for. So I literally got to rent an R8 for insurance money. I ended up scrimping and saving and, and uh, kind of saving a little bit more and then uh, buying a Corvette. The aftermarket for them is sky's the limit and you can find any part you want for those things. I understand LS Motors. Uh, I've ripped several of them apart. I just felt more comfortable in it. I understand the front engine rear wheel drive deal to it. So there's that. True negotiation starts with finding the right car. And the best way to do that is with autotempest.com. 
Auto Tempest allows you to compare the results from Craigslist nationally with all the top listing sites. So visit AutoTempest.com today and see where your next dream car is hiding.